Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Earth Energy and Environment A3 Conference and Exhibition. Thank you for joining us today on the first day of the Earth Energy and Environment E3 Conference and Exhibition's third year, year 2023. I have the pleasure to be here with you this morning moderating this session, and I would like to start off by introducing myself. My name is Jamana Tarek Abdurazik. I have a bachelor's and master's in petroleum engineering. In this session, we convene to explore one of the most promising frontiers in the battle against climate change, carbon capture, underground storage, and sequestration as we stand at a pivotal juncture in our planet's history. It has become imperative to not only curb emissions, but also actively remove excess carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. This session aims to unravel new technologies and practices that constitute CCUS. We will dive into the methods of capturing carbon dioxide at its source, the science behind its secure subterranean storage, and the enduring commitment of safeguarding our environment for future generations. By the end of this industry season se session, it's my hope that you will not only grasp the significance of CCUS in mitigating climate change, but also appreciate the collective effort required to turn this vision into reality. Please allow me to welcome our keynote speaker for this session, Chris Kendall, the president and CEO of Denbury Inc. Hi, Chris. Welcome to Earth Energy and Environment E3 Conference and Exhibition. Hey, thank, thanks, Jermana. Thanks for the great introduction. And I, I really love everything that you just shared about CCUS. Um, for those of you who do not know Denbury, my intent today is to talk uh, quite a bit around the challenge that we face, CCUS's role in addressing that challenge, which I think is, uh, as you said, very significant and meaningful. And uh, and then I want to tell you a bit about Denbury. And, and just uh, as a preface, it's an interesting day uh, for Denbury. Our, our company has been focused on CCUS for many years, has been moving carbon dioxide in massive quantities for, for several decades. Um, but today, uh, as many of you may know, we've, we've actually uh, been under an agreement to merge with ExxonMobil to really take CCUS to the next level. And our shareholders voted yesterday to approve that merger. And so today is the last day that Denbury stands alone. And, and beginning tomorrow, we're together with uh, just this great company. And, and we really see incredible potential for what's uh, to come yet with CCUS here um, with this combination. So it's an interesting day. It's actually, this will be the, the last time we present uh, standalone Denbury. So I'm, I'm honored to be here uh, and thank all of you for, uh, for asking uh, me and, and, and on behalf of Denbury to, to talk about this important subject today. You know, starting just with um, what uh, Dr. Ebenhag said about finding common ground, uh, you know, our, our world is, is full of challenges on how we approach decarbonization. I'd say there's a broad recognition that decarbonization is necessary, but there's by no means an agreement on how to do that. So I wanted to talk just a little bit about some of the um, the real challenges that we see. And, and I, I wanted to just start by setting a baseline of where we are right now. Um, and, and in particular, where the world's basic energy supply is, is coming from and what the trajectory of that supply is, is shaped like. And so what I've done here on this slide is I just brought a couple of, of key uh, elements in that I, that I wanted to, to share to help us think about this. Uh, the first is I wanted to take a look at what you see on the, on the left-hand side of this slide, which is what we call primary energy. So this is not just electricity, it's everything that is used to provide energy for anything in this world, whether it is electricity or heating or otherwise, um, it's included in primary energy. And so what's interesting, and, and the data that I'm showing you all comes from um, the Energy Institute's Statistical Review of World Energy uh, for 2023. This was published a few months ago, so it's relatively current. But uh, there are some trends that I think we really have to have to think about. The, the first is what is happening with our consumption of energy worldwide. 
And that's what you see on the left-hand side of this slide. And, and bottom line is, is if, if you look at the, the aggregation of all of these um, types of energy that are provided, whether it's from fossil fuels, nuclear, hydro, renewables, um, the growth in the energy need of the world is is strong. And, and when I just look at the uh, last 22 years, it's it's almost 2% per year that, that energy is needed. Why is more energy needed? Well, you have a couple of key things that, that are driving that. First is the global population's increasing. Certainly in some countries it's peaking or even beginning to decline, uh, more typically in, in Western societies. But in developing nations, the population is still growing and that population needs more energy. So we see that. Additionally, just as the population of the entire world is working to improve their, their economic uh, status and to get to a better place to take care of their families and loved ones, um, there's a growth in, in economic activity and the growth in econ economic activity is directly related to energy consumption. And there's a very strong uh, and linear correlation there. So what I'd say first, uh, just to, in summary on this side of the slide, is that we need a lot more energy in this world um, every year. And that's not something that I see uh, slowing down anytime in, in the near future, even with steps made to increase efficient use of energy. Uh, there's just a great need for it in the world. Now, importantly, when we turn to the right-hand side of this slide is, is just what is happening with the mix of fuels that, that provide that energy. Uh, and this slide, the, each, each line on this slide is showing the trend as a percentage of the total um, picture for, for energy, uh, the, the proportion that each fuel source is providing. And, and so you'd see some things that um, you'd expect. Uh, for example, if we turn to the bottom of the, of the slide and you see the green, uh, the green line for renewables is growing significantly over the past 22 years. And, and that's a good thing. And, and there'll be more of that. But I note that the proportion of renewables is still relatively small in the entire mix. Um, I note that a, a couple of great technologies that exist for um, low emission or zero emission energy, uh, nuclear and hydroelectric, have been fairly static during that time. Um, and then, uh, interestingly, even with all of the talk around uh, where we're going with fossil fuels in the world, um, and, and some of the public statements that have been made by various administrations or, or energy agencies, um, if you just step back and look at the facts, the fact is that in 2000, fossil fuels, coal, oil, and natural gas accounted for 86% of the world's primary energy supply. If we fast forward to last year, 2022, the last year we have data for, that proportion has reduced from 86% to 82%. And so... The mix has changed. Um, we see less oil, more natural gas. Curiously, coal is, has been fairly static during that time. But um, but what I wanted to just point out is the magnitude of where fossil fuels are today is in spite of trillions of dollars of subsidies and policy efforts by governments across the world, Fossil fuels still make up the vast majority of the primary energy supply in our world. And so what my takeaway from this slide is that fossil fuels are going to be a part of, of the energy supply for many decades to come. And, and there are aspirations for those to reduce quickly. But I, I, when I look at the numbers, I think that this is this energy transition that we're in today, it, like uh, energy transitions before us, is a multi-decade process. This is not something that can be willed into existence. We have to consider the availability and affordability of energy as we go. And, and just as the world's energy supply is based on hydrocarbons here, when as you see, decarbonizing hydrocarbons is a challenge that I think fits within the world's economy today with existing technology, we can 
address those emissions. I, and the, the theme that I'd like to have you stay with, with me here on, on this subject is that hydrocarbons or even fossil fuels are not the enemy for emissions. Emissions are the enemy. And if we can address emissions while still providing affordable, reliable energy, then we're doing the right thing for our world. And that's uh, that's really where CC, CCUS comes in. And that's what I'm going to talk about a bit as we as we go forward here. Now, we've seen many different scenarios for how decarbonization will work. And, and you know, there's a, a, a cocktail of, of things that have to happen to, to really get us to a, a net zero. And, 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 and here I'm using the IEA's net zero by 2050 scenario that, that was published a while back. Um, and and uh, it's representative of many different approaches, but, but I, what I w wanted to show you is just how the, uh, the projections to get us to net zero rely on CCUS. And so the, the graph on the left-hand side of this slide is showing where we are today on CCUS. And and frankly, it's 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 kind of embarrassing if you look at it because what it's showing is that today we're um, sequestering about forty million tons of carbon dioxide a year. You know, this is in a in a world that's emitting more than forty billion tons per year. Um, the growth in in CCUS that is anticipated by by the IEA in this scenario is taking that forty million tons in twenty twenty one up to. 2050s number of over 6 billion tons of, of captured emissions. And when I look at this and I compare it to other means of reducing emissions, um, CCUS sits only behind wind and solar as the biggest contributor to these reductions. And what I'm excited about is that this is a technology that exists today. This is a technology that's operating today and, and Denbury's right in the middle of it as I'll show you soon. But um, we don't have to clear big technological hurdles to make this happen. We just need to do more of what we're already doing, use more technology that we already have. Um, so that is the challenge here is over the next 30 years to grow CCUS worldwide by upwards of 150 fold, uh, a significant increase, but entirely within the means of what we can do as a society. Now, when I look at CCUS, and I, I, I want to spend a little bit of time just, just grounding us on what, what CCUS really is. Um, and and so there, there are elements of it. And, uh, you know, I think of uh, Jomana's introduction here and, and, and her degree in petroleum engineering and um, and how that expertise and the various uh, directions you can go with the petroleum engineering degree or other earth science degrees um, in CCUS and how closely they relate to work that's already being done in the oil and gas industry. And you can see a bit of it on this slide. So um, on, on one end of the spectrum, we need to capture emissions. And emissions come in all forms. You have emissions from what we call pre-combustion sources that are processes that actually, as part of the process, develop a pure CO2 stream that can be captured and compressed and, and injected underground. And these types of plants are, for example, natural gas processing plants or ammonia plants that are making fertilizer or even a, a fuel ammonia that I think is a very interesting uh, product that will be will be developing in this in this energy transition. Those are low cost of capture because they're not um, mixed with other other gases or, or, or uh, particulates. And so when we look at what's happening today and you even look at Denbury in, in particular, the CO2 that we're using that's captured comes from exactly those types of, of plants, either a natural gas processing plant or an ammonia plant, uh, as, as we as we've got down in in the Gulf Coast of Louisiana. Now, as we go further through the different types of emissions, you do end up with what we call post combustion emissions, and and so that is just like you'd you'd imagine. If we have a natural gas fired power plant, there is maybe between four to eight percent CO two in that exhaust stream. 
that is that is capturable uh, through processes and 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 products that exist today. Uh, that can be it can also be uh, combustion furnaces, for example, that are providing industrial heat for refining or for steel making. It can be uh, more concentrated, but a, a bit more complex emissions to capture that you'd have from coal fired power plants that can approach 10 percent concentration. And as, as we go up the uh, the, the uh, spectrum in complexity, we also go up the cost spectrum. But in the scheme of things, when I look at the cost of capture, even in coal-fired power plants where there are other gases and particulates involved, the technology, we, 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 sent, we essentially have very smart people who are very incentivized to find pathways to uh, capture those emissions uh, economically. And, and we've seen great strides just in the last few years in, uh, in some of that technology. So on one end of the spectrum, we're working to capture emissions from industry and, 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 and deliver those emissions into a CCUS system. But uh, let, let's talk about the system for a bit. And, and so what we end up with after this capture is we have a pure stream of carbon dioxide that's typically compressed and liquefied in, in what we call a supercritical phase. We move it through pipelines and then we ultimately want to either utilize it or uh, sequester it. And uh, that's where the uh, the U and the S uh, come into uh, the CCUS acronym. Now, utilization is interesting because when we think about what's possible with utilization, on one hand, we can utilize carbon dioxide for enhanced oil recovery. And again, uh, Jaman, I heard you mention EOR as part of your studies. And and uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with that, but as I'll show you in a few slides, um, EOR is an ideal utilization for captured CO2. The CO2 that's used is permanently sequestered in the process and the resulting low carbon footprint of that barrel of oil is unlike anything else on the planet as, as I'll show you in a few slides. And at, at Denver, we're very excited about that because that, does it, it really solves two problems at once. It, it reduces emissions and provides energy, uh, something that's vital in this in this world. There are other utilizations uh, and many that are being developed even as we speak, um, uh, primarily around using CO2 as a feedstock to produce other products. Uh, the one that we're most excited about is this whole, uh, this whole field of e-fuels that take uh, captured CO2, green energy, and can create a liquid fuel that uh, coming out of these plants that are being worked uh, towards FID right now um, can be ready substitutes for uh, aviation fuel and otherwise. It's a very exciting fuel with, a, with zero carbon uh, from its uh, combustion. And it's something that we see massive need for in the future. So, so that's a, a form of utilization and there are others. Um, and then as well, we have sequestration. And, and so what sequestration means is that we're taking this liquid CO2, moving it through a pipeline, going through a, um, a, a process where we find and evaluate uh, subsurface saline aquifers where um, we can assure ourselves and the regulators that CO2 that is placed into those aquifers is safely and securely stored for millennia and, and poses no risk to, to the public or, or, for, or to drinking water or anything like that. And, and so you can imagine as I talk about all of these things that there are some incredible parallels between the skill sets that we develop in the earth sciences, um, whether that's petroleum engineering, geoscience, uh, chemical engineering, or otherwise. Essentially, everything that we do in the petroleum industry, there is an adjacent skill that is needed in the CCUS industry. We drill wells to produce oil and gas. We need to drill wells to inject CO2 into these into these aquif into these subsurface aquifers. We draw we analyze subsurface geology and 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 structure and reservoir 
uh, to find and produce oil and gas, the same skill sets are needed for the finding and 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 utilizing these these underground reservoirs for storage. We use uh, 3D and 4D seismic in producing oil and gas. We need the same for CCUS. The adjacencies of everything that we do are just incredible when I look at it. And, and frankly, I think it's an exciting thing for this industry in general is that we have a whole new range of applications for these existing skill sets that, that schools like, like Marietta have, have been so strong at developing over the years. So it's an exciting time. Uh, and uh, and, and what, what's particularly exciting to me is that when I look at many other pieces of work out there that still have technological hurdles to pass before they become mainstream, there's nothing like that for CCUS. We're ready. This is a this is a technology and an industry that is working now and is shovel ready to continue to grow into the future. Now, talking about the United States a bit, and and you know, one of the presumptions of of what the potential for CCUS uh, means is that there is ample pore space, these uh, subsurface uh, rock formations that can accommodate CO2 injection, um, for us to do this by the billions of tons. And, and, and so that's something that uh, we don't talk about a lot. But what I want to show you on, on this slide is, um, is, is there's a map of the United States here you see. And, and a few things you'll, you'll see on this map are um, uh, color coding uh, shades of blue. And essentially the shades of blue uh, and the deeper the blue, the greater the, the storage capacity in these, in these uh, underground saline aquifers. And so if you just step back and look at it a bit, you'll see the, the US Gulf Coast in particular, both onshore and offshore is enormous. And then uh, we have other, other spaces in the Rocky Mountain region you see there in that Wyoming, Montana, North Dakota, and then a, a few others around the country. Uh, just just for comparison, the orange uh, shades and, and bubbles that you see across this map are where emissions are today. And then uh, we've, we've also shown where Denbury's dedicated CO2 pipelines exist. And, and it's not surprising that you'll see those right in the center of these very high density uh, pore space uh, uh, areas. I When I look at this pore space and I've talked to friends from around the world who are who are looking at where can we put CO2 in this method, uh, I'd say the United States, one of its great natural resources is this pore space. Um, just the, the enormous quantity of pore space, the location of the pore space, in particular what you see across the US Gulf Coast, uh, that opens the door to a, a number of different alternatives for both onshore and offshore storage of CO2. You couple that with the existence of infrastructure, uh, the, the, you know, Denbury's infrastructure here along the Gulf Coast that can move that CO2. And, and then finally, with a very supportive regulatory system and, and policy regarding sequestration. And, and so we, we have the trifecta here in the United States. And it's something that I think a lot of folks don't realize how great of an opportunity we have here um, right, right, in, right, right at home. Uh, so much so that even some of the folks that we talk to worldwide are contemplating bringing captured emissions liquefied to the U.S. Gulf Coast, uh, just, to, just to put a point on how, how important that is. So uh, one of the things I want to show on this slide is I, I just want to make clear how, how sequestration works in our view. Um, you know, public opinion. Uh, people don't know much about CCUS, and, and certainly what I'd hope from, from this talk today, uh, everyone that, that's together with us here can have a somewhat better understanding of just what CCUS even means. Uh, the first is that where we're injecting CO2 is quite deep. Uh, this is not being injected hundreds of feet underground. It's being injected thousands of feet underground. Uh, what I'd say is that the storage sites that Denbury is developing uh, for sequestration average probably around 8,000 feet underground. So, so approaching two miles underground. We look for 
uh, some specific characteristics of, of these reservoirs. Certainly you need the pore space uh, that, that can accommodate the CO2, but then we also have to look for pathways where that CO2 could potentially escape the reservoir. And that could be faulting in, in complex geology. It could be through uh, uh, wells that have been drilled uh, for oil and gas and not, not properly abandoned and, uh, and various other mechanisms. But, um, but what we've been blessed with is there's such an enormous amount of area that Denbury can touch with our pipeline system that we can find optimal locations that are deep, that have the right geology. Now, interestingly, much of the uh, geology that we look for is not the what you'd expect, to, uh, you know, anticlines or other other type of trapping mechanisms that you'd look for oil and gas. We tend to look for flat, unfaulted uh, areas that are that are in the synclines of of structure rather than in the anticlines. And we've found uh, great quantities of these that are that are in our portfolio now, and we're working towards the the permitting with the EPA for for injection in these in these sites. Um, one other thing that I, I wanted to mention, just when we think about what sequestration looks like, is so yes, it's deep and secure, but just the impact that it makes on any uh, land footprint is really minimal. Uh, the graphic that we have on the upper uh, right hand side of this slide just shows in that little square in the upper left hand piece of that graphic how tiny the surface impact of CCUS really is on any land position. Um, if, and if you think about it, these, these wells, these injection wells, any one of them can inject a million tons of, of CO2 per year or more. And so we don't need many wells and uh, they can be spread out over a, a great distance. We couple that with the areas where we're putting the storage and it's predominantly far from any uh, sort of population on forest land or, or otherwise. Um, ultimately, we'll, we also see it going offshore into the Gulf of Mexico. But in any case, we're, we're locating them far from populations. But even in those sites, like I mentioned here, the, the, uh, the impact on those, on those areas is very minimal. And I think uh, at the end of the day, when we see some of these working, there'll be, um, it'll be even hard to find the wells uh, if, uh, just because they're so compared to the, the thousands and thousands of acres of, that uh, consist of the sites where we're, where we're doing this. Now, going back to, to where we are at Denbury, um, a bit more, um, and, and just give you some numbers around the history of what Denbury has done and is doing today in enhanced oil recovery and what that means for what we do with uh, carbon dioxide. Um, and so when I turn uh, back a few slides and I mentioned the, uh, the 40 million tons a, a year or so that are, is being captured right now worldwide, most of that when, at being captured is being put into enhanced oil recovery. And there are a few reasons for that. Uh, the primary one is just that there hasn't been a supportive policy for sequestration in the past. And so the primary way that capture even worked was by linking up with a, an EOR specialist like Denbury, where we would take that CO2 and, and put it um, into these reservoirs and use that to extract uh, additional oil out of the reservoir. And for those of you who don't know about CO2 and enhanced oil recovery, just a, a real simple uh, way of thinking about it is that typically in primary and secondary recovery in, in, in oil reservoirs, we may capture, let's say on average, about 40% of the oil in place. That means that 60% of the oil that is in place remains in place after the, the most uh, broadly used techniques of, of production are finished. Um, CO2 EOR, on average, captures another 15 to 20 percent of that oil in place, and, and the CO2 acts like a solvent uh, in the reservoir. It, it combines with the oil, it swells the oil, and, uh, and, and then the energy of even moving the CO2 allows it to be produced. Now, I mentioned earlier that, that all of the CO2 used remains in the reservoir, 
And I'll just uh, explain how that works uh, very briefly here. The CO2, once it combines with the oil and it, it moves through the reservoir into producing wells, and if you can imagine the producing well, uh, we have a, a fluid combination that, that comes to the, to the surface facilities, and it's a combination of oil, of CO2 that is in solution with the oil at that time, and then water, of course. And so what we do with the process on the surface is we separate the water. At the lower pressure, the CO2 uh, converts back to a gas, just like if you were to open a, a, a can of Coke. But we capture that CO2, we clean it, we compress it, and we cycle it back into the reservoir. So at any point in time, there's only a tiny, tiny fraction of the CO2 that's been placed in the reservoir that's even at the surface facilities. And that CO2 itself is in the process of being treated and, and put back in the ground. So the result is that all the CO2 ends up in the ground. And... Um, and we produce oil. And so that's been the business for, for many years uh, with Denbury. And that has allowed us to build the expertise that we have. It's allowed us to build the infrastructure that we have that moves massive quantities of CO2. Um, now, going into the future, I actually see this combination of EOR, other forms of utilization, and sequestration all working beside each other, even in combination um to to achieve these goals that, that we're setting uh, for the company and 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 uh, for the industry in general to reach these very high quantities of, of co2 that we want to uh, ultimately prevent from going into the atmosphere now one thing that you might have uh, thought about this a bit even as, as i was speaking earlier but when i when i talked about what that barrel of oil looks like from a carbon footprint uh, it's it's actually remarkable. Um, for many years, a challenge we've had at Denbury is to improve the economics of enhanced oil recovery because it's expensive. Uh, the CO2, there's a cost of, of getting the CO2 to the oil field. There's a cost of handling the CO2. And, and so all of that adds to um, the economic picture of, of, of producing oil through EOR. Um, and we still we we love the the business, but it is on a operating expense standpoint more expensive than other ways of producing oil. And so we'd worked to use as little CO two as possible. Interestingly, when we think about this now, there is a different set of priorities that we're that we're working around. One of which is how much CO two can we use, not how little can we use, and. And the result of where we are when we look at all that together is something that's pretty remarkable that we're showing on this slide. And that is that the CO2 that is needed to produce a barrel of oil is far greater than the entire carbon footprint of that barrel of oil. I'll give you an example. For us, and I, I show this in, in, uh, in, in tons per thousand barrels, but I'm gonna, I think about it in, in pounds per, per barrel as well. And I'll just, uh, I'll just kind of give it, uh, give, give my uh, way of thinking about it. So the CO2 that we need to inject to produce one barrel of oil, and that, that CO2 stays permanently underground is around 1700 pounds or, or just short of, just short of a ton. The, uh, the, we have different areas of, of emission classes that we think about that when we're looking at what our emission footprint looks like. One is um, scope one emissions, and those are direct emissions associated with our business. So that is the trucks and the compressors and the machinery and, and all that that makes the operation work and produces that barrel. The second is indirect. If we use electricity, then we need to account for what generates that electricity. If it's in a state that's predominantly coal-fired uh, power, that's a, a pretty emissions intensive uh, piece of electricity. If it's an area that has a lot of renewables, then it's lower, but it must be included when we look at the overall picture. Now, when we add those two together, it's in the neighborhood of 200 pounds of, of CO2 per barrel. And so you see, we're still much uh, less than that 1700 pounds that we injected. But if you think about where the the real emissions issue with 
with oil and gas is it's not actually what it takes to produce them. It's what the emissions are of the barrel itself. And generally, um, the, w when we count the refining and combustion of the products, whether it's gasoline or diesel or aviation fuel or, or, or otherwise, that number is a big number. It's about a thousand pounds per barrel. I add those together and my scope one, two and the scope three emissions, which are those, those uh, combustion emissions, and it's about 1200 pounds per barrel. What that means is that when we're taking CO2 from captured industrial sources, we are putting 500 pounds of CO2 more into the reservoir permanently than that barrel of oil will ever emit. In a way, it's a barrel of oil that has been pre-offset uh, with real uh, CO2 sequestration. And, and when we look at it that way, and we've looked at this, uh, had third parties uh, validate this for us, we see that that barrel of oil is unlike any other on the planet. And, uh, and, and so part of our goal is as we produce more and more oil using captured CO2, that the quantity of this, this low carbon oil, we actually call it blue oil, uh, just uh, to really uh, denote it as something that's, that's completely different from anything else that's out there, is a is a product that that meets everything that we want to do um, in a, in an industry. We want to reduce emissions, but we want to provide affordable, reliable fuel, um, and uh, and we're doing all of that this way. We're incredibly excited about it, and and I, I see great potential to expand this. You know, even if we think about the shale revolution in the United States, um, uh, ninety percent of the oil in place is is still in the rock in these great basins like the Permian and the Bakken and, and, and the Eagleford. And EOR also has a pathway to help produce that oil. And it has a pathway for that oil to have the same uh, footprint where you have a negative carbon intensity. Um, and that's exciting because as, as I'm sure many of you know, there are tens of thousands of wells that have been drilled and continue to be drilled in these in these prolific shale basins. So I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up here before we turn over for questions with just a, a bit about Denbury. Um, I, I just want to make sure I, I, I give you a view of what the company is, is doing. Um, Denbury is a company that has, for more than 20 years, uh, specialized in enhanced oil recovery. And we've worked in two primary regions. You see them on the maps on this slide. The Gulf Coast region, we have a, a high capacity pipeline system that works through Mississippi, Louisiana, and Texas, actually just south of us here in Houston, um, that uh, has tremendous capacity and, and it, it's routed through the high emissions corridor of the Gulf Coast. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. We also have operations in the Rocky Mountain region, uh, a, a pipeline system that runs uh, beginning in Wyoming through Montana and into North Dakota, uh, today in the service of multiple enhanced oil recovery fields. But along the way, and you'll see in the graphic, these green diamonds that are shown scattered across these systems, those are contracted sequestration sites that we've added to our portfolio and are in the process of permitting for sequestration. Those uh, combined with the enhanced oil recovery fields, which you see showing up as the dark blue uh, drops along the system, um, combine to just create a, a system that has tremendous capacity for, um, for utilization or sequestration of CO2. One thing about Denbury, um, you know, we, we didn't start this business with the intent of just uh, reducing CO2 emissions. We started it as a business to produce oil. Um, and, uh, and so interestingly, over the past couple decades, especially in the last decade with the, the ramp up in the, the shale revolution in the US, enhanced oil recovery was uh, kind of out there uh, on its own and, and not really seen as a priority. And what that allowed us to do at Denbury here is to accumulate great talent, uh, some of the best uh, EOR talent that, that, that exists. Um, into the company and, and and apply that towards our business, which uh, which as we really looked at our strategy and and expanded it into into a more broad CCUS, we found 
number one, we have the best experts in the world uh, at at EOR and and by by just connection with EOR to CC West, we have have the, the the best folks who can can work CC West. We built an infrastructure for CO2 that's unparalleled. We have over 1300 miles of dedicated CO2 pipelines. These are pipelines that are run at a higher pressure that's meant to keep CO2 in its liquid form and transport it very efficiently across many miles. Um, we've, uh, we have more CO2 injection wells, uh, I believe than anybody in the country where we're actively working more than 500 wells uh, today that are injecting CO2 into, into these EOR fields, uh, the expertise and the, the technology around that directly applies to what we'll do with, uh, with uh, sequestration in the future. So as I, as I come to the last couple slides here before we turn over questions, there's just, there's, there's just one thing I'd think about uh, sequestration and a system working that really is scalable and economic and, and sufficiently reliable for people who want to capture their emissions. So we think of a pipeline, and just so you know, this green pipeline that we have that runs across the Gulf Coast, it's a 24-inch pipeline. If I were to take any cross-section of that pipeline, we can move about 16 million tons per year through that line. And, uh, and so if we were just going to put CO2 in one end and take it out the other, then the capacity would be 16 million tons. But what we've chosen to work is what we call a network effect. And, and what that is, is the, the best analogy I can give you is that this would look like a subway. A lot of people can ride a subway in New York City the reason a lot of people can ride it is because some are only going from one point to the next stop. Very few people are going from one end to the other. And so what that allows you to do is have multiples of the, the number of people who would go from one end to the other um, on the subway and making that uh, work for all of them where they go from their home to their place, vice versa. And so what we're doing with the satellite, and you see here, is the system we have on the Gulf Coast, and you see the current emissions in orange. Of course, there's many more emissions planned with new new construction. You see our storage sites in, in the green diamonds, and several have been added since we even made this slide. But, um, but what we can do, because we have so many places where CO2 can be injected into EOR, we'll have so many more where it can be injected into sequestration sites. We'll have different directions that it can flow um, what ultimately we see is that this overall system, rather than just being limited by the, the capacity of the pipe at any one point, can be multiplied. And, and our, our view with what we see with what I'm showing you here is that the capacity of this system could be in excess of 150 million tons per year. And if you think about that in the context of what we're trying to do in the world and the fact that just today, the world is only capturing 40 million tons per year. You really see the impact that we can have right here in just the Gulf Coast. Now, what I think about and what's incredibly exciting is our ability to do that with this combination with ExxonMobil. And, and you, I'm sure, seen and heard ExxonMobil's uh, aspirations towards growing CCUS into something that is world scale. Um, I, I see that we have a winning combination here, a system that can provide incredible reliability, incredible scalability, um, and a service to em emitters all along this, this range that can uh, that will be able to use the system to, to offset their emissions and, and or capture and, and ship their emissions and, and really uh, help us down this path to make a significant impact on emissions not just in the United States, but the world. So that's what uh, what we're uh, what we're doing here at Denbury, and and those are the the thoughts that I wanted to share around CCUS. Um, happy to take any questions that anyone in the audience has. I I know CCUS uh, is is uh, 
relatively new for many people, but uh, we've we've been living it for years and years. And I'd love to love to talk about it with uh, if anybody has questions. Thank you, Chris, for this very enlightening session. Um, besides the United States, can you tell us more about um, other countries who are active in the CCUS business? Yeah, it's a it's a good question, Jomada, and I, I'll uh, you know kind of reflect back on that map that I showed where the U.S. poor space exists. And so, what you find is that many areas that um, that have high emissions have complexities with either the availability of poor space the um, government supports or policy support for use of poor space where it does exist and, uh, and, and, and the proximity of that poor space to where the emissions would be captured in the first place. And what you find is that there's not a great combination in too many places. For example, I think of Europe, you have plenty of emissions in Europe, but the population is more dense in Europe and the availability of poor space is less common and that's why you see certain projects that are that are being done um, in Europe but they're they're more complex uh, they're typically offshore like we've seen um, coming out of the UK um, and they will make an impact but it's it, it's it, it's harder there I, I go to the Far East um, you know we have uh, emitters uh, in South Korea and Japan, for example, uh, and, and the government and the companies would love to find ways to mitigate those emissions, but you don't have the geology there. And so I, I've seen where there are projects and, and great poor space for in Indonesia, for example, um, and, and we'll see some projects there. But interestingly, Jomana, when I look at the whole panorama, it drives me back to the United States and, and that national uh, natural resource that we have. Awesome. So, um, you know, the United States potentially is um, one of the better candidates, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, and I see a, a question popped in from Xavier here. Uh, hi, Xavier, uh, it, about pipelines and just how hard they are to get built. And and uh, and I, I, if if it's all right, I'll just touch on that that question because I think it's important and it's it's very relevant right now. Just for example, uh, two weeks ago we saw. Um, Navigator, who a company that's developing a pipeline to capture emissions from multiple ethanol plants across the Midwest, actually canceled their project because of um, uh, just the difficulty in, in getting the uh, the pipeline that they need to build to do this permitted and and uh, and in place. And that's a challenge that we have across the country. And it's not just uh, specific to. CO2 pipelines. I mean, uh, infrastructure in general is an impediment to what we are doing with um, energy transition, whether it is a, a an electricity transmission line that would take hydropower from Quebec down into New England that was not uh, that was not allowed to be permitted, whether it's pipelines or um, whether it's solar farms. I mean, we see it uh, in every every aspect here. And, and so permitting will continue to be a challenge. One of the advantages that Denbury in particular has is, is the head start that we have and already having built 1300 miles of pipeline that can connect us to uh, millions and millions of tons of emissions. But it, uh, something that, that I think is needing to be a priority and we've seen talk about it in the administration, but it is, it is allowing permitting of necessary infrastructure to proceed more seamlessly to create an environment where the developers of these great projects can have more clarity uh, toward the, the uh, process of getting the projects permitted. With this, uh, we conclude our session, very enlightening session by Chris Kendall, the president and CEO of Denver Inc. It was a pleasure having you on Earth, Energy, and Environment Student Conference and Exhibition. Chris Kendall, thank you for joining us. And um, thank you everyone for tuning in with us today. Today's session will be uploaded on uh, the YouTube channel, Pi Petro. Thanks again. Have a great day. Thank you, Giovanna. Thank you very much for this great presentation.